welcome back to the stream. And yeah, we're having a, a stream at a, an odd time this week. And the reason for that is we have a little bit of a different topic to discuss today, which is how to learn Old English in the year 2023. Um, now, I put that little year in the title, both for the purposes of making a snappy description, but also because there is something that's a bit different in the world of Old English teaching and learning, uh, specifically this year. So this is what we're going to discuss today. And uh, why don't we jump right in? Um, so Old English. What's our big challenge in uh, in learning Old English? Our big challenge in learning Old English is that it's primarily it's a historical language. So it's not spoken by anyone um, as a native language, which means it's a lot harder to find, well, anyone to talk to. It's a lot harder to find uh, material because all we have are largely uh, either primary texts or um, explicitly uh, pedagog pedagogically written uh, materials, so things like textbooks. And there are a few, very few textbooks out there, but most of them tend to be light on the text. So they're heavy on the book and light on the text. And what we really want to see in, um, in pedagogical material for any language, especially in ancient language, is a lot of material to read. So I'm going to give two options in this stream two sort of pathways you can take to get into Old English. One is the, um, the, the what we might call the, the smoother path, the smoother path that uh, leads up Mount Old English um, with nice views and it's, it's paved, it's, it's, it's wide, there are benches to sit on and beautiful scenic outlooks. Um, and then there is the narrow and uh, rocky path that's quite steep and requires you to do a little bit of maneuvering, but it has the great advantage of being available to you at no cost. So the two options are the one path that you can go up that's um, where the way has been cleared for you, but unfortunately it does cost a bit of money. And the other option is the, the do-it-yourself um, option, which you don't need to pay a cent to do, but you're going to have to uh, um, assemble your own resources and uh, use them with a bit of skill. So this is the idea. So I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to spend a tiny little bit of time talking about the, the, uh, the easy path. <laughs> and then most of the time we're going to be spent talking about, uh, we're going to spend talking about the, uh, the do it yourself path. So, uh, briefly, I will, um, I will just say that all of the links for everything that I'm going to discuss here are in the description on YouTube. Um, so, Check those out uh, later, or if you're watching this in the future, um, you can check it out now. But let's jump in and let's take a look at option A. So option A, and I'll have to zoom over to the side webcam and get my things at a nice enough size. So option A, you could come study Old English with me at the Ancient Language Institute. Uh, they, we have a course um, that I put together. Uh, it's actually now a sequence of three courses. Eventually it will be a sequence of six <laughs> where you go from having absolutely zero Old English all the way to being able to read through the entirety of Beowulf and actually not just being able to, but reading through the entirety of Beowulf in, uh, in two calendar years or six semesters. Uh, so this is the start of that, uh, that path. It uses, uh, the textbook which I have written uh, called Oswald Berra, which is a story, well, I like to think it's a charming story about a, a fun-loving bear in Anglo-Saxon England and all the trouble that he gets up to. And what it does, and I'll show you, uh, I'll show you exactly what it does. It is the Old English version of um, Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata, or at least a spiritual successor. I will show you what I mean. Uh, it starts off and it's a very simple story. Thar is on Englelande little toon, and on them toone is little hoos, and on them hoose is little mite. And it goes on and there's a, a vocabulary in each chapter which tells you all of your new words, as you can see here. 
And uh, basically, we take you through this book uh, one chapter at a time and gradually build up your old English skills. Um, so we've seen this work really well. Um, now it's been going on for two semesters and we have the first cohort that's gone entirely through this book and are starting to read original texts in Old English. So that is available in uh, online. All, it's all done over Zoom um, and it's available through the Ancient Language Institute. Again, link is in the description. Um, the registration for this semester will, will close um, on the 12th, which is not too far away, but I have it on good authority that maybe that in the case of Old English, that date might be uh, open to <laughs> open to some exceptions. So you didn't hear from me. Uh, so anyway, that's all I'll say about that. That's if you want to go in the, uh, the route that's been sort of paved and cleared. What about the zero cost do it yourself route? Well, this is going to involve a little bit of a different approach. So I'm going to show you a sequence of books, a sequence of resources, which you can use. Starting, let's go over to the, let's go back to the start of this. Starting with a book called First Steps in Anglo-Saxon. And the beautiful thing about this book is that it's available uh, for free uh, on the uh, Internet Archive. Go all the way back to the start, please. Um, here we go. So first steps in Anglo-Saxon. I don't know why it's acting a bit odd. There we go. So um, it is a book which, which is written in the Victorian age uh, by a linguist named Henry Sweet. And Henry Sweet is a big name in the, um, in the Old English, um, in the Old English sphere, at least in the 19th century. And it, on into the very beginning of the 20th century because he wrote a whole sequence of textbooks for, um, for learning Old English, and there are four. The first one is First Steps in Anglo-Saxon. The second one um, is the Anglo-Saxon Primer, and we'll go through all of these. The third one, the Anglo-Saxon Reader, and the fourth one, the second Anglo-Saxon Reader. And you'll notice back then, uh, Anglo-Saxon was the, uh, the term that's normally used to refer to the language. Uh, more recently, uh, we typically call it Old English. Um, but this is just something to know as you're looking through these, these older books. Um, and how do these books work? Each of these books um, has two parts. And this is very typical for uh, Victorian era textbooks, uh, language textbooks. And we know that it's not perhaps ideal, but this is the way it is. The first half is a grammar of the language. And the grammar is sort of pitched to a different level depending on the difficulty of the book. So the, the uh, first steps in Anglo-Saxon has a very basic grammar. Uh, it's only 25 pages long and uh, gives you the, the broad outlines. Then if you go up a level, so let's take a look briefly in the primer. You see the grammar starts on page one and ends on page 54. So it's a 54 page grammar longer, goes into more detail, covers the same ground, but gives you exceptions and general tendencies and variation and things like that. And then as you go farther into the Anglo-Saxon reader, and you sometimes have to go through the verbose preface, um, you get uh, quite a long grammar uh, with much more, going into much more detail. So that's the first half. What's the second half? The second half is texts, it's readings. And uh, these readings are not graded in uh, any significant way. They're generally unadapted primary texts, except for in this very first book. In the very first book of the Sweet series, the First Steps in Anglo-Saxon, uh, we have heavily adapted or, um, or purpose-written texts for learners. Um, but even so, there's, <laughs> you're not going to be able to just pick them up and start reading them. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, let's see if we can head over to the first one. Doo, doo, doo. Sometimes you have to play a little bit with the, uh, the navigation here. Should get us more or less right in the... Start of it. Okay, so the first one. 
the first text we have is um, a little bit of Anglo-Saxon astronomy, and I actually adapt uh, adapt some of this material um, for a, a small part of Oswald Bera. But it starts like this, and tell me uh, if you know if you're a speaker of modern English, is this immediately comprehensible? Bethisumidanyarde, betharesunnan, selsunne gath betuelnon helvnon eordan, on dai buvon eordan. And on nicht under this erdon. Avrahel bit irnen de umbthas erdon. And also leorte. Schint under thar erdon on nicht swa swa heo on die death buvan urum havdum. On the halve the heo schint thar bit die. And on the halve the heo ne schint thar bit nicht. We hatat on ne die from sunnan upgange of aven. From thare sunnan upgange, old that hell eft becume thare hell er upstach, and so on and so forth. So, there are definitely things that are comprehensible about this. Perhaps something like sunne, helvone, um, I see MSCR, MSCLRHD, the sun, um, the sun does something between heaven and earth exactly right. So there are a few things about this that are comprehensible, but there are also uh, a few other things which are not. Um, so what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to work with the dictionary and work with the grammar uh, in order to figure out what's going on here. Um, but it can be done. It's better to do it with this kind of text than with um, a primary text that's unadapted. So another benefit of this uh, of this approach is that all of the diacritics are present. So for those of you who haven't had much experience with Old English, there are a few diacritics or accents that are put on the letters. We have dots over C's and G's. Uh, this shows us that uh, the letter is pronounced in the case of C with a dot like a CH rather than a K. And in the case of a G with a dot like a Y rather than a G or a R. So these are things that many texts will not give you, and you'll be wondering how to pronounce every C and every G. With enough exposure, you become used to the places where a C makes a CH sound and a G makes a Y sound, but at the start, who wants that extra work? So it just sort of lowers uh, the load on us as learners. Um, and it also marks long vowels, which not all texts do. Also very helpful because many words are completely different uh, based on whether the vowel is long and short. So I'll give you an example. Uh, God, God with a short O means God. God with a long O means good. Sometimes relevant to distinguish between these things. Um, another one, mon. Mon means one, like the impersonal one. One does not do this. And Mon, with a long A, uh, means uh, sin or crime. So again, something that is uh, relevant for the meaning. So length is contrastive in Old English, and it's useful to show it. Uh, so all this, uh, this text by Henry Sweet has those virtues. And, you know, what you can do, what I like to do, I like to take this, copy it out by hand. This actually does have some benefit, um, but merely by copying it out by hand or by retyping it, you're getting some, some familiarity with the text. You're getting familiar with the, the shapes of the words. You're seeing things. Maybe you don't understand everything about it, but it's still, I think, useful, if a bit tedious. I would copy it out into a, a document of some kind, maybe a Word document or something like that. Get up the uh, word spacing to one and a half or, or double spacing so that you can have little spots to, uh, to write uh, in between these. And uh, then whenever you come to a word you don't know, go and look it up and put the translation that you're going to use above the word. And go through like that. Now it's going to be laborious at first. Um, so uh, let me see if I can show you an example of this. So luckily, we have access to all of these um, all of these books as PDFs, so we can download them uh, without any uh, moral qualms. So let's go and let's see 
what we have. Okay, so, Seo sunne gath betweonon helvone on eurdon. So let's do a bit of work. Now, unfortunately, the text is quite, you know, the, the line spacing is quite tight here, so we don't have enough room to do, um, to do what we might want, but you can get at least an idea. Uh, so let's get, let's make this text a little smaller so we can fit it. Uh, hopefully that's still somewhat visible. Maybe I might have to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so say we are going along sale. Okay, I'm not sure what sale is. Okay, what's sale? Uh, let's go into the, let's go into the dictionary. Uh, and we're going to use Wiktionary for now. I'll talk more about dictionaries in a, a few minutes. Um, but I'm going to go look up sale. And I'm going to see it has lots of different lots of different languages, but we'll go down to Old English. And I see, ah, sale is an article. Um, it is the nominative feminine singular of se, the. So sale queen, the queen. Okay, so maybe we can translate that as the in this case. Uh, so that's what I'll do. I'll go back and I will write down the sale. Um, and I'm not going to get too worried about the grammatical stuff right now. I'm just going to go through the text slowly and trying to understand it. Um, sale sunne, I'm reasonably sure this means the sun, so I'm going to just leave that. Gath, gath, what are we going to do about gath? Uh, so then we go back to the dictionary. And we look up gaff. And it doesn't actually give us anything useful. So we're going to go to another dictionary and look up gaff. And we're going to look it up with the length mark as well. Ah, and here we see that it means goes. And so we're going to go back to our back to our text, and we are going to right in goes. So, seo sunne gath, the sun goes. Betweonon helvone and eurdan. Now, if you're a true beginner, you won't know necessarily how to pronounce all of these things. Um, but uh, for the purposes of just explaining this for now, uh, we, can, we can assume the pronunciation and we can talk about how to learn it later. Uh, so, the sun goes Betweonon, this sounds a bit like between. Heovone, this sounds like heaven. This looks exactly like and. And then we have Eurvon, which sounds kind of like earth. So the sun goes between heaven and earth. Ah, voila. We have our first sentence. And you could continue with this approach and go all the way through the text until you're reasonably certain you understand what's going on. If you reach a point where it's not quite clear, then, you know, you leave in... Say you, you get to this word irnende and you can't figure out what it means. You look it up in the dictionary, it's not there. So you just put a question mark there and you move on. And you may come back to it. Uh, actually, chances are you will come to understand it fairly soon uh, in another way. But there's no sense in just dwelling on something. Um, dwelling on something that's incomprehensible when there's, a, you know, there's enough comprehensible stuff coming up. Uh, so just if take the approach that... Uh, uh, they teach you when they teach you how to do a standardized test. If you don't know the answer at all, don't spend all your time on it. Come back to it, uh, and I endorse that approach here too. Okay, so um, this uh, this is the general approach. You're going to go through the text, and you're going to laboriously at times try and make sense of it using all the resources at your disposal which include dictionaries, which include the grammar at the start of the book. The grammar at the start of the book has enough for you to understand everything in the book. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at what that involves. So we'll go back to the grammar. And say you're curious about what was going on with, um, with that sale. You know, what's going on there? What is the deal with the sale? You learned it was an article. All right, so let's, oops, I've got to leaf through this a bit. Um, you learn through the, uh, through the dictionary that it was, um, 
that it was an article. So then you're going to go flip through the grammar until you find something that's relevant to what you're, you're looking at. And here we have, you'd be starting to read, you'd get to page five and you'd see, hey, wait a second. Seo, seo duru, seo menigo, um, seo chiriche. Interesting. Um, so, seo is a nominative and it is, we know from the, uh, we know from the, um, from the dictionary that it's a feminine as well. So it's a nominative feminine singular. Here we have it again. Masculine se, neuter that, feminine seo. So you might go off into your, um, into your notes and write down, okay, there's an article, feminine singular nominative seo. You know, you're going to get, you know, it's going to take a while. And you're gradually going to be going between the dictionary, between the text, between the grammar, and understanding each of those things a little bit better with each, um, with each, with each uh, run through. And gradually you're going to get through the texts. And then what I would recommend is go through them again. So now that you've gone through and you've understood the text, maybe take a break, you know, take a few days, read something else, read another text maybe, and then come back to it and read it through and see the difference. See now what was difficult before. Uh, what was difficult before has now become relatively easy or at least easier. And you're actually seeing some progress. And some of these words that were incomprehensible before are now part of your part of your toolkit and you go forward and you do another text which is going to be a little bit more difficult and you go through the same thing gradually through this um through this process you're going to start to build up your model of the grammar you're going to build up your ease of accessing um, vocabulary that you have stored in your head you have you're going to build up your ease of reading and you're going to build up the actual store of vocabulary, which is probably the, the thing that's uh, most in our way uh, when we pass the, the first stages of the language. So this actually does work if you do it for long enough, if you have the um, patience and the perseverance to go through. You can go through and you can read all the texts in our textbook. So let's go back to, um, doo -doo -doo. let's go back to, First steps in Anglo-Saxon. So you see the first uh, text we get is a little bit of didactic uh, material about the world, about the sun, about the moon, and about the night, moon, about the year, about the rain. And it's just little little things, um, little vignettes about what, what wind is, what hail is. Um, very interesting. And you and because this is this material is based on original sources, it actually does is somewhat um, somewhat instructive as to what people thought. So you get through this and you've learned a lot. You've learned about the sun and the moon, the wind and the rain and the hail and yada yada yada. And you've got a little bit of vocabulary. And you by by the sweat of your brow, you have now started to understand the nature of old English grammar. You started to understand that words change depending on whether they're the subject or the object. You've learned this because you've gone into the little brief grammar at the start of this uh, book and you've read over, you've read it over maybe 10 or 12 times while searching for some, searching for the answer to some mystery you've had when reading the text. So you've become quite familiarized with this. Now you can go on. Now you can go on and you can read the second text. Bemonna craftum. Bemonna craftum. Um, which means about the uh, the crafts or jobs of people. So about people's jobs. And this is actually uh, a little bit of uh, an adaptation of, uh, of the uh, Colloquy on the Professions, which is a text uh, written by Alfrich, who is one of our major um, Old English prose writers. And Alfrich um, was uh, very, very concerned with education. Um, he was, um, Alfrich was uh, sort of in the uh, monastic administration and he was, uh, he was an abbot and he was tasked with writing essentially textbooks. And he wrote a textbook uh, on, on learning Latin. And the textbook is called The Colloquy on the Professions. And it's a very interesting text because it 
it's uh, set up in dialogue form. And this was very typical for language instruction at the time. You have uh, a dialogue and the different characters in the dialogue talk to each other and they talk about what, in this case, what's the best profession? Is it the farmer? Is the farmer better than the smith? And so on and so forth. And uh, people who have read uh, Oswald Berra uh, might recognize some of this material. Uh, I pick up this, these themes, uh, these same themes in one of the chapters of, of Oswald. Um, but the benefit of this is it's, it was designed as a language teaching text, although the language it was teaching was Latin. So it shows you the different nouns in all of the different cases, because that was the whole point. And when it gets translated from Latin into Old English, which it was to help the students, right, the people who spoke Old English, to help them learn Latin, give them a bilingual edition, um, it still retains those virtues in Old English. So we get to see the same noun appear in all sorts of different cases. And because it's a dialogue, it's a bit fun. And people disagree and they fight and, um, and it's always easier to understand dialogue than it is to understand narrative, I find at least, because in dialogues, there's a convention that people are speaking to each other in a more or less realistic way, which means that, that people are going to constantly, um, they're not going to, one person isn't going to talk endlessly unless you're talking about a Socratic dialogue. Um, but one person isn't going to talk endlessly. There's going to be an attempt at least to portray communication. And all of these things help us because the text is actually communicating with us or we're trying to get the text to communicate with us. So when two people are having a conversation, they're frequently sort of ch stopping to check um, to make sure that they understand each other. And although a fake dialogue doesn't do this, it at least resembles a real dialogue in that it's more like a conversation in which two people are trying to stay on the same page throughout. Um, so you get things, as an example, you get things like this. Allah, Allah. This is a, a sort of a, a particle, uh, an interjection, which is something like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, Allah, that is Michel Yederf. Uh, and so the fact that someone is saying, Allah, whoa, to whatever was said before, it tells you something about it. It tells you that this is sort of surprising or overwhelming or something like that. Um, just checking on the text, uh, a question about uh, trying to go backwards. So, so yes, you could, you could do this. You could go to early modern English, then to middle English, then to old English, or you could do it the other way around. You could go to old English and then move forward. I have not tried uh, the going backwards strategy. Um, I find that going directly to Old English is not too extreme, um, at least uh, at least as far as I can tell with my students, they haven't found it that way. They haven't needed much Middle English or any Middle English background, but I think it would be kind of fun to do that. The problem is um, that in terms of resources, there are very few resources that explicitly teach early modern English as a separate language. Um, the best you can do are things like um, Shakespeare vocabularies and things like that um, because it isn't really by many accounts a separate language it's uh, it's you know it's early modern English um, so you may find it um, difficult to find resources for that 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 make the su a sufficient distinction between modern English like contemporary English and uh, early modern English and then when we get to middle English there are uh, also not that many resources compared to old English old English has as, as I've complained about the lack of Old English resources, but um, but compared to modern English, oh, sorry, compared to Middle English, Old English has a lot of resources. There aren't that many resources available for Middle English. So I find it's easier to start with Old English. Um, start with where the resources are. Um, yes. So, um, so we're, yes, where were we? I was saying that uh, the structure of the dialogue is an aid to comprehension. And so you can go through this and you can, you know, you can see the sentences are often quite short. Estis man an of tinum jeferum? Yise. So is this man one of your companions? Yes. Kannst du anything? Do you know anything? On the craft each con. I know one profession. And then it goes on. Um, so the dialogue, as you can see, um, 
is a, is a pretty comprehensible, or it can at least be a pretty comprehensible type of text to start with. So this is a good one. Um, then you will get through this and it, it's not without its humor. Um, it's uh, decently long. Uh, people get into a fight about what the best uh, what the best job is, and they figure out how to settle their argument, and they all learn a valuable lesson. Um, but then we get to the real fun. And as you can see, I'm going to maybe zoom in a bit on this. Beowulf's Seath. This means Beowulf's journey. And what this is, is a prose rendering, a prose version of the first half of Beowulf. So it is very enjoyable and it is uh, lavishly um, uh, supplied with diacritics for learners, which you will not find in most Beowulf, um, in most Beowulf texts online. They expect you to know already uh, what the palatal C and palatal G, where they are. Um, so, which also means that when people, you'll see people doing Beowulf recitations online, but because those aren't listed, uh, oftentimes they'll, um, they'll get it wrong and, and put a cut in where there should be a ch or vice versa. Um, although that's a fairly minor thing in the grand scheme of things, it's still useful to know. I like to know exactly what the pronunciation was of, of everything that I'm reading. Um, so then you can read Beowulf Seath, and this has the great virtue of being actually quite interesting. Uh, this is a, you know, it's one of the, the gems of of of, uh, of English literature, Beowulf, and this is a a this isn't immediately comprehensible, obviously. Hip ye lamp yeoth at on kinning was on denum, se was hot in hrodgar, on se hrodgar was mare heretoga, swath at his magas him yorne ye hirdom. You know, if I went out of my house and started saying this to someone on the street, they would probably um, have questions, and rightly so. Uh, but nevertheless, compared to Beowulf itself, which is written in, uh, which is which is written in meter, uh, and it's written with vocabulary that often is even within Old English quite rare. Um, this is a great way of getting of approaching it. So. You have a lovely text here, and it's not even short. It's not even short. And I'm, I'm still paging down. So by the time you get to the end of this, you will have read A, an interesting story, <laughs> B, um, accumulated a lot of vocabulary, and C, gotten used to the, the rhythms and the, the patterns of Old English grammar. By the time you get through with this, you can go on to the next book. And the next book is called The Anglo-Saxon Primer, but it's really more of an intermediate reader in my, um, in my point of view. Like the uh, first book, it starts with a, a grammar. This one is quite a bit longer and, and more detailed. Um, you know, including things like how in many words R often shows up in uh, one of two places. So we have words like rinnon, which shows up as irnon. So the R has jumped over top over that vowel and gone into the coda position, the end of the syllable. Or we have um, we have things like um, gars versus grass. So this gives us modern English grass, but the R will flip. Or we have words like wort, which is the past um, past participle ye wort of wirchon to work. So wort. But sometimes this will show up as wrocht, which gives us rot, as in wrought iron. Uh, anyway, so it gives you these kinds of extra extra bits, which will be useful to you when you get into the texts. And the texts, I have to, ah, okay. The texts start out with, um, with easier stuff. 
with easier stuff. So this, um, these texts, it starts out with something called sentences, and these are largely taken from um, Alfred's homilies. So same Alfred that we talked about before with the colloquy on the professions. Alfred also uses, um, also has written uh, homilies where he discusses various, um, uh, various uh, religious matters. You know, he was an abbot, so this was his job. He would, he would give these homilies and uh, and write them down. He would sometimes send them as letters to people. And this um, this first text in the primer is a selection of easier sentences that come from the homilies. Um, oh yes, I almost forgot to mention. Um, we also do have for you. Let me get up onto the uh, onto the full screen. Um, on the on Ancient Language Institute's YouTube channel, we will very soon have, um, and you know you can count it in minutes, uh, a good way to start. Uh, which is the Old English in Action series, of which there are currently um, two episodes. And this is a way of getting into the vocabulary of Old English um, just using, uh, using video clips. So you'll see, um, you'll see a person walking onto the screen, you know, a man walks onto the screen, and then you'll hear my dulcet tones saying, Se where? Se where? Se where? And this is the word for the man or the words for the man. And you'll learn uh, a good, um, I think I'll, almost about a hundred words uh, that way. And there will be more coming on that, uh, on that playlist in the future. Um, so let me get the channel up so that you can, you can go over there right now. All right, here it is. Wait, where is it? There it is. So, side webcam. There we go. So, Ancient Language Institute YouTube channel. Soon, very soon, there will be more um, Old English content here. So recommend you go over and subscribe to that so that you see when it comes out, which will be very shortly. Um, but yes, what else? So you're in the primer. You go through these first sentences and you're gonna take the same approach that you've been taking the whole time. Keep going till you comprehend. So this often takes the, this often takes the form of that sort of fine tooth comb reading, that intensive reading that I showed you earlier, where you're going through and every time you don't know a word, you stop to look it up within reason. If you can't find it immediately, then just forget about it. You don't want to spend forever. But uh, this is a way of gradually unlocking a text that's, let's be honest, above your current level. Ideally, you would have a text that's at your current level. And that's the whole point of why I wrote Oswald Bera, a text that adapts to your level as you go up. But Realistically, if you want to, if you want to, the more do-it-yourself approach, you can sort of scaffold yourself up to the text by doing this work, by um, by going through and looking things up when you don't understand them, writing marginal notes, all these sorts of things, and you may take four or five run, uh, runs through a text to understand it, and you should be expected, you should be expecting that, and you shouldn't be, um, you should try if you can, not to be frustrated, um, almost at all costs. You're doing something, that, something that's hard, but you're doing something that does have, a, does have a clear path to success, which is simply being consistent with it and spending the time. So there are a few things in life that actually work that way, where if you just sit down and do it enough, you will get better. Um, maybe there aren't that few, but not everything in life works that way, I can assure you. Uh, language learning is one of them, and it's one that works better if you're enjoying yourself. So that's my, you know, take that as my official blessing that you can have a good time while you're doing this. Um, right, so. Um, then you get on to something else. You get on to... Why can't I zoom this properly? There we go. 
extracts from the Gospel of St. Matthew. So, now you're getting into what we might consider primary texts. Although this is a, a translation from the Latin Vulgate, uh, it nevertheless was intended to be read by its material written for native speakers of Old English. Uh, and you can start to read uh, read this material. And what's really nice about this material is you can easily find a translation into whatever other language you want. So you can work with it as a bilingual text. And um, if you are a student of Latin, you can get the Vulgate up and see the actual source material and understand maybe why they made certain choices in translation. And there's quite a lot of this material in here, all, all told. Um, so you have maybe six or seven pages uh, in, in this text. There are, there are some others in other texts that I'll show you in a minute. Um, <laughs> Galactic Send, yeah, the mashing your head into it approach. When you got no other option, this is what you have to do. Um, so, uh, oh, Joanna's things. Welcome back. Welcome back. Austronesian languages. Um, uh, not a whole lot. We haven't done a whole lot on Austronesian languages. Um, of course, that's definitely something that I would find enjoyable. Uh, the, the trick would be uh, the trick would be finding the time to do it justice. Um, but let, let's take a look at uh, some of the other things in here. We have the next test, text, which is called Old Testament Pieces. And this, these come from, again, from our old buddy, Alfredge, uh, his, um, his uh, homilies on the Old Testament. And so he essentially has a, uh, a summary of the entire, of the entire uh, I don't know if the word plot is appropriate, but uh, of the Hebrew Bible in, um, in brief and with his own commentary on it. And this, uh, these texts here are drawn from that. And so we see, and here we have, see Samson. So more, more uh, text inspired, uh, inspired by the Bible or commentaries or restatements of the Bible. And then we get a text called From the Chronicle. And so we switch genres and we get to see um, we get to see historical narrative. And so these are, uh, these come from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which have a slightly different style than you'll see in the other kinds of prose. So it's good to start to broaden your horizons, see different constructions being used by the historical writers versus um, the, uh, versus the religious writers. And, and you get to see uh, more of the depth of Old English. And as you're going through this, um, as you're going through this, you're now at the point where you, if you can understand this, I would consider you a solid intermediate um, reader of Old English. And fortunately it's doing a bit of nonsense there on that page, but uh, what do you know? And you can just keep going. And now at this point, I think you're probably at the stage where you don't really need my help anymore. If you're going through and reading this, even if it's a bit difficult, you now know where to go to get all the information you need and you're starting to your ability is starting to snowball. Um, so that's the end of the um, of the primer. What's nice, and I highly recommend that you take advantage of this as you go through. If you find a little part that's confusing, go check the notes because um, Henry Sweet acted like his, uh, his name suggests. He was very sweet to us and he, um, he wrote little, uh, little explanations of difficult bits, including where in the grammar the things are uh, explained. So very useful, very, very useful. And then he has a glossary. So if you don't want to use the dictionary, um, because sometimes it's hard to find things in the different dictionaries, we'll talk about that in just a moment. You can use the glossary here which has all of the vocabulary in the entire book. Okay. So if you've gotten through the primer, you're now sort of at an intermediate level. You might be wondering what else to read. Um, so let's take a look at doo -doo -doo, the Anglo-Saxon reader. So here is where you start getting into uh, longer texts, more difficult texts, 
and poetry. So there is a longer grammar in the um, Anglo-Saxon reader. Then there's a section on meter in Anglo-Saxon in Old English. Uh, so the the meter in Old English is very different from basically every other language that you may have studied. Um, so it's very interesting, uh, something I will do a video about at some point. Uh, but essentially, Old English is alliterative. Uh, Old English poetry is alliterative. So uh, you have it's two halves of a line. Maybe I can find us an example in the in the book. I've been uh, spoiled by the by those texts which have the the links. Um, here we go. Okay. So the meter is basically uh, each line is divided into two halves called hemistics uh, or um, half lines <laughs> or verses. Uh, they have different uh, different names, uh, and in each line, you have to have alliteration that ties the two, uh, the two verses, the two hemistics together. So um, here we have in the second line, um, actually, let's go on to the third line. That's, I think, a little bit clearer. Hale Hildedeur Hrothgar Greton. So we have the H's in the stress syllables of the words in the first verse, alliterating with uh, one of the words in the second verse. And the specifics of this are a bit intricate. You can see um, Sweet goes on for a fair few pages about it, but that's the gist. Uh, and when you hear Old English poetry recited, you're, you hear this um, a very particular rhythm. Um, yeah, so well, this is now within your reach by the end of of this reader. So you start going through these texts and you'll see that they are a lot less, uh, there's a lot less hand-holding, there's a lot more variation in spelling presented to you, there's just walls of text, uh, but you're not going to be, um, you're not going to be cowed by this because you've seen everything like this before just in fewer, in a lesser quantity. Now it's just more of the same. So you go through, you work, you sweat, <laughs> and you get through and you get introduced to a very, very wide selection of, um, of Old English literature. And then by the point that you're finished with this, and you even get to read parts of Beowulf in here, um, as you can see, this is uh, the episode of Grindel's Mother. By the time you get finished with this, you don't need my help with anything. You can go off and do uh, what you need. So that is the sequence that I recommend. If you want more, there is another reader by an American, I believe, named James Bright. Yes. And actually, the <laughs> there's lore about this. Uh, apparently, uh, Sweet was a bit annoyed that Bright um, made a, a book that was so very similar to his own. But, uh, and you can see in the uh, preface of, actually, I think we actually have it here, uh, in the preface to Sweet's later editions of the reader, um, he, yes, and the American Bright's Anglo-Saxon Reader, which has been republished in this country by the enterprising firm of Swan, Sonnenschein, and Company. The latter bears a striking resemblance to the earlier editions of my reader. <laughs> um, it is a pity that the author has not adhered more closely to what appears to have been his original plan. He might have also consulted the convenience of myself and those who use my reader by following the same system of numbering. So there's a bit of sass going on here. I'm sure there's some, some, uh, I'm sure there's some, a story there, but, um, but we can benefit from, from this because Bright made a very, very similar reader, same kind of format, outline of the grammar, followed by a bunch of texts, although the texts are different from what um, Sweet chose. Not entirely different. They're about half the same, um, but it's just more reading. So this is more reading roughly at the same level. So what you can do is you can sort of flip back and forth between Bright's and Sweet's readers um, and, you know, if the next text in Bright, in Sweet is a bit too hard, go over and get find where you are in, in uh, Bright and you can read up to there and then maybe you'll be able to go back to Sweet and Sweet and Bright and Sweet and Bright and you just keep going until you're done. 
Uh, and then finally, there's a, a second reader, uh, which is probably more niche um, in interest. So it's called the second Anglo-Saxon reader, Archaic and Dialectal. And this, um, these are sort of texts that are a little bit off the beaten path. So early texts and non-West Saxon texts. But this is good if you, especially if you're a linguist, um, you uh, will really enjoy this um, because for those who don't know, Old English is um, a relatively standardized language uh, in its written form. It is uh, standardized around the dialect spoken around the court at Winchester. So in the uh, West Saxon uh, kingdom originally. And um, there was there were other dialects. It's just that even when people spoke those other dialects, they would write in West Saxon typically. But this isn't always true. And so we get, there are some texts out there that, uh, that show you what other dialects were like or really early texts that show you more archaic versions of Old English. So that can be useful, but if you, yeah. Again, if you got to this point, you don't need my advice on anything. Um, then let's talk a little bit about dictionaries just before we, just before we have to, to head off. So one thing, where is it? So you saw me using Wiktionary earlier. Wiktionary is extremely good for Old English. Um, it is very, very normalized, which means that the there's a consistent uh, spelling for every word, which is somewhat anachronistic for when it comes to Old English, but very useful when it comes to a dictionary. Uh, so there's always a, a clear place, there's always a clear word form to look up. So let's take an example, Stigon. Um, this is just an example entry. One downside of, of this dictionary is that you have to wade through other languages to get to Old English. What I sometimes like to do is just go up into the URL bar and, and type the search there um, and keep the hashtag Old English at the end. But here you go, Stigon, and what's nice about it, and I'll zoom in so that it's a bit easy to see, you get full morphological tables for almost every word and related, morphologically related words. Unfortunately, there, there aren't many example sentences and those that do exist are mostly made up, um, which uh, is not totally ideal from my perspective, but uh, not that I have anything wrong with people, modern people writing Old English. I mean, that's why Oswald Berra exists. Uh, Oswald, where'd you go? Oswald, where'd you go? Right, someone who had a problem with people writing in Old, Eng in old English in modern times wouldn't write this, but nevertheless, um, I think it's, it's always better to take in a dictionary examples from, from uh, original texts. Um, uh, Mike, uh, do they also list alternative forms? Sometimes, but not consistently and not very often. Um, if you want a dictionary that uses, that shows you alternative forms, you're going to want to go to Bosworth Taller. And Bosworth Taller is a digitized version, a really nicely digitized version of an old, old dictionary. Um, so you can see it also does have examples from texts, although they're usually glossed in Latin. So <laughs> knowing Latin helps, um, but not always. So he walks in the court. Fate goes ever as it must and shows you where the, the quotations come from. So what I do is I use both. Uh, Bosworth Taller is usually better if you are dealing with a spelling variation because the search is a little bit fuzzy. And so if there's a spelling variation, it'll usually catch what the, what the word is in the dictionary. Whereas in Wiktionary, it's quite rigidly standardized just by necessity of that dictionary format. And so we don't have all these alternative forms. Um, yes, yeah, so so to finish up with your question, Mike, the alternative forms are much more searchable in the Bosworth Taller Dictionary than on Wiktionary. Um, and then there's also, if you're using the Sweet series of um, of books, there's also the Students' Dictionary of Anglo-Saxon by Henry Sweet, which um, you know is is to a certain extent synchronized with the um, with what goes on in his books. So that's very useful. Uh, and all the links to all this stuff 
are available in the description in the YouTube stream description. Um, so just go down and you can get all of that. Finally, I will say there is, uh, I wrote a blog post on this two years ago with some free old English resources. Um, I've discovered more since then, so I'll need to update it, but there's still quite a lot of useful stuff here, uh, including, including, where is it? Um, there it is, the magic sheet. The magic sheet of Old English inflections, which I recommend all students print out and put on their wall. This is by Peter Baker. Uh, it's an excellent aid. Uh, and so while you're absorbing all these forms, sometimes it's nice to have a little printout where you can just look up and say, wait a second, what is the dative singular for neuter, weak, adjective, you know, it's all going to be there. So that is the harder road, um, but it is the road that's um, available if you don't want to spend any money, if you're just looking to get started with a, a kind of a, a low cost option, uh, fortunately low cost, more work. So that's the trade-off. The other alternative is to go, um, or if you want to learn with me specifically, uh, is you can go check out, um, check out the Ancient Language Institute and check out the beginner old English course there. Uh, we are starting soon. Ah, who is this guy? Um, we're starting soon for this semester, uh, but um, if you're watching this in the future and uh, and what's it called, August, 20, August 12th, 2023 is far in the past, um, still check it out anyway because we're, we're running, um, we run cohorts uh, regularly, so uh, there will probably be one coming up, coming to a, coming to a web page near you before it's too long. All right. So I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone knew what the best way for them was to learn Old English in the year 2023. The only thing that is very 2023 specific about this is um, is the new course, the new Ancient Language Institute course. Uh, not that new, but um, new in 2023, and the book Oswald Berra. I've had a lot of um, uh, a lot of questions on uh, social media, on on Twitter, and on YouTube about um, whether Oswald Berra is available um, to buy to, for people to self study. It will be at some point, but it is not quite ready yet. So. Um, if you're interested in using that material before it's published, um, you can do so through uh, Ancient Language Institute and um, otherwise you can wait maybe, you know, you never want to say there's a timeline for these things, but uh, uh, sometime in the not so distant future. So that is unfortunately all the time that I have for today to blabber about Old English, surprisingly, for those who... <laughs> <laughs> who've talked to me about this before, hearing me um, st stopping to talk about Old English is, uh, or stopping talking about Old English is a, a rare thing. But um, So if you have any questions, put them in the comments on YouTube and uh, I will be sure to write back. Otherwise, I wish you happy studying, whether you choose the broad, open and easy path or the rocky, uh, the rocky path up the mountain. Both of them lead to the summit and there's a wonderful view from there. All right. Well, until next time then, thank you all very much for joining.